Wait, this game has time travel? That gives me an idea. Usually if something that includes time travel, it can be cloaked and prod with all the loopholes that make no sense. And that is still the case! Why don't I have any memories of doing this before? It's time magic! This is the part where you say, What's with the mask chain? Well, during the stunt, it actually rips back and it looks like a toupee, and you try and repair it, but it don't actually go as well. So now, I'm off to a different time zone. Yeah, I'm not good. I'm just going to go with it. They finally done it! They got rid of that window shit! It's finally gone! Did I stop it? I've got to say that this game had a mixture of success for me back in the day. Cars with weapons, destroying other cars with destructible environments, where everything explodes, even things that shouldn't explode. They made me think, was this game made by Michael Bay? It would explain a hell of a lot. Vigilante 8 Second Offense is a sequel to the original. It's a 3D over the top action car combat game with some futuristic elements to it, like other cars that we ain't got yet. For the campaign, it revolves around time travel from the future to the past of the year 1977, evolved around this guy who desires more power for his business empire and making deals under the table in the past. Instead of stock market investment like I would have done, or done the back to the future thing with that magazine book, this guy's not too bright, is he? I would have created my own Jurassic Park. That's all I can think about now if this game had dinosaurs in it. <sighs> Maybe your mother can make my dreams come true. Imagine that, cars with weapons and dinosaurs in it in the past, heck that could be for the third game, if there is ever one. Wow, I completely drifted then, well, back to the game. I was impressed by the amount of characters that you have here, there is a great variety of them, and especially when you start unlocking even more throughout the quest mode. There are multiple characters you play as, and each one feels different to the other, and you're bound to have your favourite one. Mine was the one with the satellite, and the one with the cannon where it knocks the vehicles flying! your <laughs> bet! Well, the controls, they're pretty bad on the Dreamcast. I felt like I was constantly fighting with it at first, where it seemed oversensitive, especially with the motorbike and the ninja car. Where well, one slight bump in the road will make you go out of control, or if you get hit by an enemy, you're going, Wee! And you will be going flying with these two, and going on water with the motorbike, just forget about it. It's unplayable on the water, I could not make that bike go straight in the line unless I was reversing. I thought that it was my controller at one point, so I changed the controller and I was still getting it on the water. <sighs> so if you're the bike and you're on water, just remember to reverse it and you will be fine. However, once when I got used to the sensitive controls, the game is actually quite fun with the other vehicles. There's one thing that took me a bit of time to realise, is that there is a reverse button. Tried B, nope. Tried the back triggers, nope. Tried every other button on the controller. Nope. Could not find that reverse button and the instruction manual was no help where that was in every other language apart from English. We got French, Spaniard and Italian. But not English. I must have got the other Power Region version. <laughs> so I was like, okay, maybe it don't have a reverse button. It'd be the first car game that I've been counting what don't have one. But okay. Then about the fourth character in, I found the reverse button. You know what it is? It's down on the D-pad! <laughs> it's just my luck. It just had to be something silly like that, and after that I'll just use the D-pad for controlling the vehicles, then the analog stick. You do have unlimited machine gun ammo, except if you keep on firing it constantly, it weakens, and the time between each bullet gets bigger until you give it a tiny little break and then it's back and forth again. You can get more powerful weapons by collecting these floaty icon weapons, or boxes, or destroying other cars. As long as they got weapons when you destroy them, then you can pick them up afterwards. There are some lock-on weapons, and most of the time these do work. It's just now and again it fires out a target that I didn't intend it to. And there are manual target weapons as well, and the flamethrower is quite powerful and easily my favourite one. However, each vehicle has a special weapon to collect as well as a standard type, but I felt that the motorbike got the best special weapon where that does a lot of damage. There's one thing that made me laugh out loud, is when you use a truck driver's special weapon, it had me in hysterics. 
You can imagine that someone being outside your door while you're playing this and taking it the wrong way. <laughs> I know what it's meant to mean by towing other cars, but I can't help it. My mind just went there and I just couldn't stop laughing. You can improve your vehicle by collecting these discs when a vehicle is destroyed, turning your car more better, faster, and meaner, and more badass. From an ordinary vehicle into a super powerful Megazord version, health, armor, speed, and so on, yet these discs are there for a limited of time, so you have to be quick to pick them up to get that Megazord version. You can see damage effects on vehicles to add to the immersion of the game of how beat up your car can get, which I thought was a nice effect to the game. There are vehicle transformation icons like hover, amphibious vehicle, alongside skis, and I found myself using them a bit throughout my playthrough. However, they do change on how the car feels compared to it on wheels. There's three modes to this game. Arcade is basically the last car standing where you're on a map with other cars in an all-be-all. Then there's a quest mode in the main story where you can play as most characters apart from three of them. Each character has their own quest while all comes together to explain the whole story at the end. And at the start of the level there's this text to each stage what explains what's going on a bit in the story. There are mission objectives in the story like protecting something, destroying enemies or collecting things or destroying a site. There's three sets of tree campaigns with the same missions on each tree of five characters and only differ through each tree. So there's five characters with the same mission so you'd be doing this five times over what does get a bit tiresome. And you do have to do all the activity missions to unlock the hidden characters to proceed further into the campaign. You can proceed onto the next level without doing the missions, but to unlock the other characters you do need to do these mission objectives. The AI can also pick up mission items and when there's a mission of collecting something around the map, and usually there is, you can be playing a guessing game. Does this car have to box what I need to complete this mission? And if your guess is wrong and this is the last vehicle on the map, you'd be doing this map again. Then we've got survival where you fight off waves and waves of vehicles and each car you destroy it adds a number at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. It's like beat your own score, I did not mind this, it's just an extra mode to the game. I found the AI enemies were well programmed for the time but yet predictable in certain actions what they will do. However, if you're after that challenge out of the game, this game does offer it on the hardest settings. However, on the hardest settings it's no walk in the park, it had me swearing on more than one occasion. The enemy vehicles can also restore their health by collecting these spanners like you do. It's just something that you've got to be wary of because usually they disappear from your site and then come back while you're fighting someone else. It's like you always got to be focused on one to defeat that one or else it's going to disappear from your site and collect a spanner and come back to you again. There are bugs while I've encountered where you just pass through an objective and this can be frustrating where you have to stop a lorry on a bridge in a mission objective. And this did frustrate me where I had to wait for the lorry to go all the way back round again on the map to the bridge and it just passed through me again. So I had to restart the level and after that it was fine. But I just don't get what caused this bug. Yet, I've got to say there are some bugs that just made me laugh. Where your vehicle just obscures in midair and sends you across the map. <laughs> At least I've got a bird's eye view from it. This is just one of them bugs that just made me laugh all the time. It's like, can I cause it again? And it does occur quite often. Sometimes you go above on buildings and stuff. <sighs> but that's on the nuclear reactor one where you get above a building then it like sinks you through the map and then you respawn. It's like, <laughs> whatever, I'll go with it. The level designs are these small eight maps with different atmosphere, like one minute you're going through the swamp area, then the next you're going skiing in the cold winter snow in the Olympics or going down a slope. Whee! I love the car skiing. I thought the variety was nicely done and the ones that I liked the most was Florida with the NASA rocket spaceship what you can launch and the meteor site one with the gigantic space ant. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not kidding, that surprised me. A gigantic ant. I've got to admit, I did like that surprise. However, I did find out if you go into the options menu and go into the stack margins and press the back triggers and press AA, it gives you this like command code bit and if you type in old levels, you get access to all new levels from the past Vigilante 8 game. <laughs> it's like, that's a big slap in the face. You can go through the whole entire game 
and not realize that you've got access to all these other levels. You've got access to all new stages, a military base, Vegas, and a new skiing level with snow falling down. It's just such a shame that it's hidden behind a stupid code. And this can easily be overlooked. Although these are only in arcade and survival mode, it's not in the quest option. So, but, oh, if you do not know that these levels are here, you are missing a great big chunk of the game. I like these stages more better than the ones without the code. It's just that these just had so much more variety in them. So I only found this out when I was trying to look for a certain upgrade for the car to find out which car was prone to give me that upgrade. So I looked online to see what it was and I couldn't actually find it. Instead, I found this level code. And it's like, of levels get access to new levels? What? This is stupid. This can't be serious. And I type it in and it's like, I love these new old levels. <laughs> So, if you ever plan to get this game or emulating it or anything like that, remember, go in the options menu, stats, and type in the old level code. There's one thing that I liked more than most was, there was destructible environments that added to the chaos to the game. And I went around destroying everything I can and blowing up that nuclear reactor. This is brilliant. For the music, there's some soundtracks that I liked and others that I didn't. It's really a 50-50, yet I do wish that there were more tracks to this game. All the graphics, they're alright on the Dreamcast, but I just found the graphics average for the system. It's probably down to where it was being released on multiple systems, what held it back a bit from going to its full potential on the Dreamcast. Nevertheless, don't get me wrong, this is the more prettier version of the game. There are cutscenes, there's one from the start of the game and others at the end of each character's campaign to add to the story of what's going on from their perspective. Although these cutscenes are over quite quickly, I don't know how I feel about that. Where along the game is it's 50 minutes between each character and times that by 15 characters it equals 750 minutes, what's so around about 12.5 hours. So yeah, it is a decent length of the game of its time and from doing that math, I don't want to touch math again in any review that I do in future videos. So in the end, I thought the game was alright once when I got used to the very sensitive controls. Although, I don't see myself going back to it where the missions do get tiresome. However, I'm glad that I got to play this. So have you played Vigilante 8 Second Offense? What do you think of it? Leave it in the comments below. Until next game, you guessed it, I'm fucking off. But how brutal the AI can be. They yeah, if you want a really challenging game, what make you swear, I recommend this one on the hardest setting.